Lee Murray was that crazy English hoodlum. He was a part of the biggest bank robbery in like the history of Great Britain. That's how wild can do this. He's still in jail right now. He was fighting in the UFC while he was a full on criminal. <laughs> I love that. Shit. On February 21st, 2006, Colin Dixon worked as the manager at the Securitas Cash Deposit in England, just south of central London. At around six o'clock in the evening, Dixon had clocked out from his job and was on his way home when he was stopped by flashing blue lights coming from an unmarked car behind him. A tall man in a police uniform approached him and asked him to get out of the car. He handcuffed Dixon and placed him in the back of the unmarked police car. Only it wasn't a police car at all. Dixon was blindfolded and placed into a van while two other fake police officers drove to Dixon's home. When his wife, Lynn, answered the door, the fake cops explained that they had to speak to her about a serious traffic accident that her husband had been involved in, and she and their child should accompany the officers to the hospital. Colin's wife and child were also placed into a van and taken to a farm in West Kent, where Colin Dixon already lay waiting. They were bound, held at gunpoint, and threatened unless they cooperated. The criminal's goal was the biggest cash heist in English history, and the whole thing all began with a street thug turned MMA fighter by the name of Lee Murray. Robbing banks is never a good idea, but you know what is a good idea? Leaving a like for the channel. If you guys enjoy documentaries, I do these every single week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on post notifications, and obviously, remember to leave a like. Let's get back into it. Lee Murray was born in November of 1977. When he was born, his family home was located near a district in southeast London known as Shooter's Hill, possibly because of its history as a renowned location for highway robbery. He was involved in precursors to gang activity at a young age, as he had friends while primary school age that all hailed from Buttermarsh and its surrounding estates, calling themselves the Buttermarsh Boys and getting into fights with boys from other estates in an effort to protect territory and establish pecking orders. Meanwhile, Murray's father, Brahim Lamrani, was from Morocco and was described as violent and domineering, and the two did not get along. They argued, with the argument sometimes becoming physical. Eventually, Lee Murray began to fight back against his father and began to knock him out. Fearing that the arguments would result in serious injury or even death, Lamrani moved out, leaving only Murray's mother to raise him and his siblings alone. When Lee began attending the Eaglesfield Boys' School, he met his best friend, Paul Allen. Allen would also eventually go on to be his accomplice. Murray had picked up a reputation as a violent man by this point. Allegedly, Murray and the Buttermarsh boys were in contact with drug dealers from Nigeria and won local territory in an eventful turf war for drug trading. Murray would allegedly be in charge of shaking customers down to ensure they paid and got into street fights often and sometimes even seemingly randomly. He was outright hostile to the police officers that attempted to catch him and his gang and placed informers in their organization and would follow cops around in his car and even openly intimidate and mock them in the street. In early 1999, just weeks after the birth of his first child, Murray got caught up in a gang turf war that led to dozens of arrests. Murray, however, managed to walk away clean. After his lucky break in avoiding arrests, like so many who seemed to have been fighting all their lives, Murray seemed to find his calling in fighting professionally. He had his first fight in December of 1999 against fighter Rob Hudson. Murray knocked him out within the first round, earning himself the nickname Lightning Lee Murray. After this, he began training seriously. One of the academies he trained at was Peacock's Gym, a famous facility frequented by celebrities and famous boxers like Lennox Lewis. He also lived up to his reputation as a violent man outside of the ring, getting into constant bar and street fights. In July 2002, Murray attended a UFC event in England with his coach. One of the other fighters grabbed his coach jokingly, but before the matter could be settled peacefully, Murray's best friend, Paul Allen, threw a punch. The night ended with him getting into a street fight with famed UFC fighter Tito Ortiz. Allegedly, Murray knocked Ortiz out. He turned around and faced me and he hit me with a shot. He dropped me for a second, I came to my feet and I clinched him and uh, I threw a few knees, then the police broke us up and that was it. That was, that was the fight, that was it. it. Eventually, after years of winning matches by brutal knockouts, Murray managed to make his way properly into the UFC ring as a fighter, fighting Jorge Rivera and defeating him in the first round. However, even though it was his first UFC bout, it would also be his last. Shortly after the fight in 2005, Murray attended a birthday party for a British model at a London club. At around three o'clock in the morning, a street fight broke out. 
Murray was stabbed in the chest multiple times, resulting in a severed artery and a punctured lung. Though he survived, he was so scarred and stitched up that his career as a fighter was in jeopardy due to the danger of his wounds reopening and his marketability being threatened. While Murray partially had his experience with street fighting to thank for his success in the ring, it was also ultimately his downfall as a professional fighter. While Murray had risen and collapsed as an MMA fighter, his gym, the Peacocks, had turned out to be the center of a criminal ring. Martin, Tony, and Paul Bowers were the operators of the gym, who, allegedly in the face of their gym's rent being tripled, decided to turn to crime to make cash. They planned a series of robberies, with their biggest being a raid on a high-security warehouse at Gatwick Airport. Their plan was to disguise themselves as security officers, use a fake van to get into a depot, and steal over one million pounds of foreign currency. While they were let in at the gate of the warehouse, they were caught almost immediately by flying squad officers who, as it turned out, had bugged the Bowers' offices and planted hidden cameras at the warehouse. The plans and arrests were revealed publicly, and while Murray himself was never implicated in the Bowers' planned robberies directly, it's easy to wonder if their planned robbery is what gave him the idea for his own. In February of 2006, over a year after the Bowers arrest and Murray's stabbing injuries, Murray, his friend Paul Allen, and over a half dozen accomplices set out to rob the Securitas Depot. The story seemed like something out of a movie, complete with an inside man and latex prosthetics. Michelle Hogg, the daughter of a policeman, made prosthetic disguises for the crew to hide their faces. Meanwhile, Amir Hassanai, one of the accomplices in the heist, had signed up to work at the depot and given information regarding security measures back to the gang. Days before the heist, Murray was arrested after he had crashed his Ferrari and fled the scene. But he was out by the time the heist was supposed to take place, and on February 21st, the crew put their plan into action. Around 1 a.m. that day, after the crew had posed as police officers and abducted the Dixon family, three vehicles headed to the Securitas Depot. Colin Dixon accompanied one of the fake police officers to the entrance of the depot, allowing the robber to be buzzed in by the security guard so that he could overpower the guard and allow the rest of the crew inside through the front gate. There were 14 staff members inside the depot working the graveyard shift, and Dixon informed them that the crew had his family and told them not to touch the alarms. Amir, their inside man, had used a camera attached to a belt to film the inside of the depot earlier, which allowed the crew to know its layout and security. For over half an hour, the crew emptied the vaults in the depot by wheeling carts full of cash into their trucks. The haul of the heist, about 50 million pounds, or more than $100 million at the time, was only a quarter of the money at the location. The only reason they had to stop was that they filled their truck completely to capacity. Around 3 a.m., the police were called by the Dixon's child, who managed to escape a cage they'd been placed in. By that time, though, the thieves were long gone. But if there is such a thing as a perfect crime, this was not it. The thieves had taken so much money that the heist had become an international sensation. The surveillance footage from the heist was televised nationally and made it online, and a two million pound reward was put out for information about the robbery. But even without the heat and exposure, there were huge mistakes made on the part of the criminals. One of the vehicles the crew had used was set on fire in the middle of a field, seemingly in a misguided attempt to keep a low profile. The other vehicles were abandoned in various spots, all of which the police would later discover. One of them, a van used to store the cash, was found within 72 hours. It contained guns, bandanas, ski masks, and over a million pounds in cash. Michelle Hogg, the makeup artist who had allegedly designed the prosthetic disguises the thieves wore, was arrested and questioned within 48 hours. Acting on a tip just one day later, the police raided the homes of Murray's friends, Leah Rusha and Jet Mirbuk Papa. In Rusha's bedroom, there were plans of the Securitas Depot and nearly 9 million pounds hidden in a nearby garage. On top of all of this, the car crash that Murray had gotten into right before the heist proved to be a costly mistake. The car was impounded and after the heist was searched. What they found was burner phones with phone numbers of other members in his crew saved on them and even an audio recording talking to a fellow gang member about the heist. Michelle Hogg also decided to testify against the crew, explaining how she created the disguises for the crew to enter the depot and prevent identification. Murray himself, though, much like with his earlier gang turf war, seemed to get away clean as a free man, at least momentarily.
you're watching this documentary, you're asking yourself, Steve, this can't be true. Yes, this is true. This really happened. Uh, and you can't write a story that's crazier. They need to make this into a Hollywood movie. Murray fled to Morocco along with his friend and co-conspirator, Paul Allen. As a Moroccan national, thanks to his father, he was safe from being extradited to England. He is reported to have lived a lavish lifestyle for months. But unknown to him, he was being tracked with 24-hour surveillance from the Moroccan authorities. On June 25th of 2006, only months after the heist, Murray was shopping at the Mega Mall in the city of Rabat with Allen and a few other friends when a portion of the mall was sealed off. Suddenly, a small army of armed police officers surrounded Murray and his crew. There was a physical struggle, but eventually, the four men were arrested. They were charged with violently resisting arrest and possession of drugs, not too different from Murray's run-ins with the law back in his youth. His friends, including Paul Allen, were extradited to the UK. Murray, however, could not be extradited due to his status as a Moroccan national, but he was given a 10-year sentence, later extended to 25 years to be served in Moroccan prison. In 2008, he gave an interview where he mentioned that he is currently training, hoping for a return to the UFC and a pardon from the Moroccan king, Mohammed VI. It's hard to say what Lee Murray's biggest mistake ultimately was. Strange as it is to say, if he hadn't always been so prone to fighting, he may have had a more successful and long-lived career as a fighter. On the other hand, if the crew had simply taken less money, it's possible that there would have been less exposure on the case, which would have given them more time to tie up loose ends. But it doesn't matter too much at the end of the day, because while you can't say that crime never pays, you can say that in the end, it certainly didn't for Murray or his crew of thieves.